data science has been becoming a growing profession and is also the heart of many organizations. That's why Data Science Portugal was born. The first community created by data scientists for data scientists. ESPT wants to gather anyone who works in the field and chat about any topic over this great subject. All members from our team are committed to make sure that the data science field evolves in a healthier and stronger way. To ensure that the focus is on sharing knowledge, we guarantee that our stage is not a place that supports any commercial or recruitment content, and our kind speakers are committed to share their experience for free. We want you. Let's do bigger things together. Join us at any event all around Portugal or online. Hi everyone, welcome to today's, today's webinar. My name is Mafalda and I have Mario with me. Hi Mario. And we are going to be our hosts for today. So the, the agenda is going to be as usual. We are going to do a small opening, then we are going to pass our talk with, with, Telmo, with Telmo, followed by a short Q&A. And after, and after that, uh, don't drop the call because we are going to do networking session on this platform. So as you guys already know, this is an informal community for data science enthusiasts in which we are always trying to improve and do very, very events. And for that, we have kind of uh, do's and don'ts, philosophy. So we promote knowledge sharing, we organize open events, we promote networking, but please uh, do not try selling or shameless promotion once uh, you are here in our stage and please do not do the hiring and so that have, have that in mind when you fill our form for the call of the call for proposal if you have something to share or if you have a team or or if you have any type of project you want to share with us or the community please do it and we will get back to you or your team in a few days You can find us in Aveiro, Port Coimbra, uh, Lisboa, Porto, and now online in our YouTube channel. This is our current uh, site, Data Science Portugal, where you can find future events by Data Science community and also other communities, and you can find job offer offers and much more. This is uh, our social network, you have Slack, Facebook, Meetup, and LinkedIn. Please contact us if you have any doubts about data related and join us. <laughs> I want to thank also DevScope for sp sponsoring us in this webinar. Uh, please make the questions in the, this platform, WebEx. Uh, you can write a question, but uh, we would prefer it if you raise your hand for talking. I think we need to talk much more or a little. Uh, I want to present our, uh, our speaker is Tom Peters. Tom Peters is an M ML engineer or researcher at Apple. Uh, this is the, the team of the talk, learning to see in 3D by Tom Peters and the stage is your, yours and you can explain <laughs> much better than me, <laughs> I think. Should I start? Yes. Okay. Let me then share the slides. I think you can share now. Yeah, I can. Okay, so I hope you can see the screen. Yeah. Oh, cool. So, well, thank you for the introduction, Mafalda, and also thank you and the rest of the team for inviting me to speak here today. And of course, uh, also thank you to everyone uh, who's attending. I hope that you enjoyed the talk and learned something useful. So just before we start, 
uh, a couple of uh, disclaimers. So one, uh, the opinions here are my own, not my employers or previous employers. And uh, this is a pretty extensive topic. So I, I had to make some simplifications and omissions to make this fit a uh, 45 minute slot. So I hope you'll forgive me for not explaining some things in uh, greater detail. Oh, and of course, uh, any mistakes that you see on the slides are mine. Uh, if you do find any mistake, please uh, let me know. I have my email and my Twitter account at the end of the slides. So the structure of the talk will have mainly two parts. So initially I'll begin by giving an introduction about what is depth estimation and what it's useful for. Uh, then I'll talk about the commonly used data sets and data sources and uh, what kind of models we can use. Then I'll go to the meat of the talk. And uh, this is work that was done by my team while I was at Google. And for me, this is like the most interesting part of the talk. And that's how to deal with moving objects, uh, particularly people. Finally, I'll end the talk with some main takeaways. Uh, so about me, uh, as Mafalda said, I'm currently a machine learning researcher at Apple, uh, where I am a part of the machine translation team so uh, those of you who use Apple devices might, might have seen the translation app and also the system-wide translation. Uh, my team is the team that builds the models for that. Before that, I was at Google uh, where the work that I'll show you here was done. And uh, before that at Babel, and even before that at IT and Technic. So uh, what is step estimation? So what I'll be focusing here on this talk will be then step estimation. So the input will be an image and the output will be for each pixel, how far away it is from the camera. So if the pixel corresponds to say like a face of a person, then we want a model that tells us how far away from the camera that face is. And there are many different variants. So one is stereo depth estimation. And uh, this is what you do when you have multiple images. So you can measure the parallax between the images and use that to estimate depth. Uh, then uh, there's also monocular depth estimation. And uh, this is when you have just a single image as input. I'm having some problem here with the slides. For some reason, it's not changing when I click, weird. Um, and then there's also depth in filling or in painting. And uh, this is what happens when you have some prior depth, but you don't have depth for every single pixel. So this is basically, the idea here is to basically interpolate the missing values. Oops. Uh, so in this talk, I will focus on molecular depth estimation, although I'll also mention uh, the other two, at least in passing. Uh, in terms of applications, uh, depth estimation is particularly useful. So one obvious application is augmented reality. So some of you might have played with the IKEA app uh, that I'm showing here on the right. And with that app, you just take your phone camera and it scans the room and it allows you to put uh, IKEA furniture anywhere in the room. And for this to work, you need to build an accurate 3D model of your room. And for that, you use depth estimation. Another application is in 3D reconstruction. Say that you have satellite imagery or street view imagery and you want to build 3D models of the buildings, uh, you'll probably want to use that estimation there as well. Uh, then there are applications in visual effects, such as the one I'm showing here on the right. So here you have an input video and an estimated depth map. And, uh, as a post-processing step, since we have an estimated depth, then we can apply this uh, synthetic defocusing where we can either select to defocus uh, either the person or the background as we see fit. Uh, another possible application, and this is a bit more of a toy example, is something called the Ken Burns effect. And uh, this is a case of view synthesis. And uh, this is what I'm showing here on the right. So you have an image of the Beatles and uh, you see that it seems to 
be like a 3D video. Uh, and the way this was done is someone took the Beatles image, fed it through an app estimation system, and then used that to build a 3D model of the scene. And so once you have the 3D model, you can move the camera around at least slightly and compute novel views. And so then you can generate this effect. So as I said, you will be focusing mostly on a monocular depth estimation. Um, there are plenty of classical computer vision techniques for uh, depth estimation and particularly the multi-image scenario. Uh, so when you have multiple images, uh, that's actually similar to what our brain does. We have two eyes and the images that the two eyes capture will be slightly different because the eyes are slightly apart. And by measuring these small differences, you can actually estimate depth. If you only have one image, then the problem is not as well posed. Uh, however, we can still do a proper job for the following reason. So if you look at this image here on the right, uh, and if I introduce two trees in this image, uh, although the two trees are of the same size, uh, one of them looks smaller and the other one looks bigger, right? So the one that's like further away from the camera seems to be a lot bigger than this one here. And the reason for that is that our brain picks up visual cues from the scene, such as the vanishing point here in the middle and all these vanishing lights, and uses that to kind of estimate the geometry of the scene and uh, then estimate the depth. So if our brain can do this, we are reasonably confident that we can teach a neural network to do the same. So what kind of data do we have for this problem? So one source of data is to use uh, LiDAR, sonar, or radar. Um, so that's basically specialized hardware that sends a pulse and measures the round trip time. And by doing this, you can estimate how far away something is. Um, and there are some public data sets, such as the Waymo data set uh, or the Kitty data set. And these were data sets that were collected with a car that had LiDAR on top, such as this car that I'm showing to you here on the left. And uh, then this setup also has a camera that takes pictures. So you get data like what I'm showing here on the right. So you have the input image and also like these colored points that you see here are the points for which we have depth estimates. Uh, you'll notice that we don't actually have a depth for every single point. So this would be a case where we want to do depth infilling or depth invading that I mentioned before. Uh, but you can use this to train your neural network. Uh, another possible data source is uh, to use depth cameras such as Kinect that probably you've heard about. And there are multiple technologies that these cameras use to estimate depth. And there are also some publicly available data sets such as the TOM data set. And if you use a setup like this, then you'll get uh, some depth, some dense depth estimates like the ones I'm showing here on this image. The cons of these techniques is that the cameras tend to be a bit bulky and like or expensive. And uh, so like collecting these data sets takes some time and costs some money. So they are fairly limited. Another approach is to use stereo data. And this is basically what happens when you have uh, two images that were taken at slightly different positions, such as our two eyes. Uh, the way this works is actually fairly simple. So you look at the two images and you're going to find matching points. So if the slides move, oops. Okay. So first you're going to find a point in an image and then the corresponding point on the other image. Once you do that, you're gonna measure the position and compute the difference between the two positions. So you'll notice here that on the image on the left, the point is closer to the middle than on the image on the right. So by measuring this difference in displacement that we'll call delta x, we can plug this in this formula where d is the distance between the two cameras and f is the focal length and Applying this, we can compute depth. And if you apply this method, then you'll get a depth map like the one I'm showing here on this picture. 
So using the, any of the previous techniques, then you should end up with a data set that looks something like this, where you have an input image and a ground truth depth channel that we'll use to train our, our neural networks. So now that we have some data sets, let's look at how we can model them. So there are of course multiple different uh, networks to do this. Uh, all of them are some variant of a convolutional neural network. And this is one possible setup called the hourglass network. Um, it might look a bit complicated just looking at the slide. There's like a bunch of information right here, uh, but it's simpler than it looks again. So all of these blocks that you see here are basically convolution blocks and these convolutional blocks are represented here. So they basically do a bunch of convolutions in parallel. And you have the convolution sizes here on this table. The integration behind this architecture is the following. So you take the input image and you feed it through first layer of convolutions. After that, the model branches. So on the top branch, you see that you just apply a few more convolutions and you get to the end. On the bottom branch, you'll see that we pull. So pull basically means pulling. Uh, that is, we are down sampling the image and then we apply a few more convolutions and we branch again. So the reason for this branching and pulling is the following. If you have a filter of a fixed size, say a five by five filter, and you apply that to the input image, then the five by fil five by five filter will cover a small portion of the image. However, if you downsample your image, that is if you make the image smaller, then a filter of the same size will cover a bigger part of the image. And so this means that the, the five by five filter will be able to capture features at a wider scale in the downsampled image. So if you apply a bunch, a bunch of downsampling operations, then in the end, you'll get to a fairly small image and there the five by five filter will actually capture a big portion of the image. And the reason we are doing this is that we want to capture features at different multiple scales. Uh, because we don't know where these cues that tell us about the geometry of the scene are. So we just want to compute them at, all over the place and let the network learn which ones are useful and which ones are not. Uh, in case you're wondering why we don't just use bigger filters, the reason is that bigger filters require more parameters and that makes the network harder to train. So right now we have a model and uh, we have data. So you might think that this is a straightforward regression problem, right? Uh, but actually it's slightly trickier than that. And uh, the reason is the following. So if you use an naive loss function like uh, mean squared error, like I'm showing you here, the problem with this is that uh, using this loss function, all errors are alike. But in practice, error depends on the distance from the camera. For example, if your model makes a one meter error for an object that's 50 meters away from the camera, that probably doesn't matter that much. And for many applications, you can get away with that. However, if your model makes a one meter error for an object that's like two meters away from the camera, then probably your model isn't usable because that's an awful prediction. There are many ways to deal with this problem. Uh, probably the simplest one is just to work in the log domain. So what we do is instead of having the model predict depth, we actually predict log depth and we train the model to predict this log depth. And uh, the intuition for this is that the log function is concave. And so when the depth is large, small variations matter less as I exemplify in this picture. So if you look at a perturbation around the value eight, you'll see that it gives you like a small perturbation on the Y axis. If you apply the same perturbation around the value two though, you see that it gives you a much bigger perturbation around the Y axis. And so basically this loss is capturing this notion that errors matter more when you're closer to the camera. So that was uh, one architecture, so the hourglass network, uh, but in computer vision uh, or rather uh, in depth estimation as in many other domains, Neural networks tend to work a bit better for classification problems rather than regression. 
So here is a model that uh, treats depth estimation as a classification problem. So what you do is you take your depth range, you discretize it into buckets, and you have the neural network predict a distribution over the buckets. Uh, this is called the DORN model, and this was a state-of-the-art model for a while. And uh, it still is a convolutional neural network, but it works slightly different uh, than the one I showed you before. So again, you take the input image, you apply a bunch of convolutions, but then the branching here is different. So one of the branches uses something called the full image encoder, and this is just a pre-trained model like your ResNet that we use to compute a single vector that represents the whole image. Then we have a branch that applies regular convolutions. And finally, we have some branches that apply this ASPP thing that's basically dilated convolutions. Uh, for those of you who don't know what dilated convolutions are, basically they're similar to regular convolutions, except now the kernels are dilated, meaning that, for example, if this is a kernel, you apply the kernel to one pixel, but then you don't apply it to the pixel next to that, not the uh, one after, but then you apply it again. So it's as if the kernel is hollow. And the reason for this is, again, we want to capture features at multiple different scales. And uh, by using this dilated convolution, uh, we don't have to use bigger filters because we just expand smaller filters. So after you do that, you just apply a few more convolutions, and then for each pixel, you predict the probability distribution over the buckets. Uh, similarly to what I mentioned for the regression network, uh, it's also a good idea to work in the log domain here. And uh, the reason, again, is because errors matter less uh, the further away from the camera that we are. So that means that we care more about precision for uh, smaller depths than for larger depths. So what you do is you compute your buckets and you get uniform buckets, but in the log domain. And so when you convert the buckets to the linear domain, your buckets will be exponentially spaced. Meaning that buckets further away from the camera have lower precision, which captures the intuition I was talking about. Finally, um, I said this uh, model is a classification model, so most of you probably thought that you just put a softmax layer on top and then apply a cross-entropy loss and you'd be done. But it's actually slightly trickier. So in regular classification, you just put a softmax layer, you apply cross-entropy loss, and that works because the classes are independent of each other. So if you're doing image net and uh, you have, say, like cat and dog, and airplane is categories, like cat and airplane, and airplane are independent from each other. But that's not the case here with depth estimation. So, because in this case, there's an ordering between classes. Uh, to better understand this, let's look at this slightly different uh, problem. Let's say that you wanted to build a model that predicted Amazon reviews from one to five stars. If you train a model and then make a prediction on a product and uh, you look at the probability distribution over buckets and you see that your model thinks that the most likely score for the product is five stars, but then the second most likely uh, score is a one star. This is, should make it, you a bit skeptical about the model, right? Because that just means that the model is confused. Like if the model thinks that it's very likely that um, uh, that product is a five-star product, then the second most likely prediction should be four stars and not one star. And this reasoning also applies to that estimation. You don't want the model to tell you that the object is either, let's say, 25 meters away from the camera or one meter away from the camera. So the solution to this is to use a technique called ordinal regression. And uh, basically, what this does is this forces the model to only make a prediction if it's confident of uh, the lower classes. So if you, by using this, if uh, a model predicts that an object is say from 25 to 30 meters from the camera, then the second most likely prediction will be the bucket immediately before that. So using either of these approaches, 
and uh, using the data sets that I showed before, we can now train some models. And uh, I'm showing you here uh, some outputs of using the hourglass network. So we have the input on the left, the ground truth in the middle, and the prediction on the right. And by looking at this, you can see that the model is doing a fairly reasonable job. Uh, the predictions seem to match the ground truth closely. However, I want to note that the predictions seem like a bit hazy or a bit foggy, and uh, this is a well-known problem with regression. And uh, if you look at the output of the, the DORM model, you're trained on driving car data, you'll see that the predictions are much sharper. So uh, the predictions, again, are on the right, and the ground truth on the left, on the in the middle, I mean. And uh, you'll see that the two match really well, but you don't have the issue of fogginess. Okay, so I made it through the first part. I hope this wasn't too painful. Uh, I now am ready to explain to you um, how to deal with moving objects. So I'll talk about why this is a challenge and uh, how we solve this problem. So first, why is it hard? Uh, the problem is that data for this kind of scenes we care about is hard to combine. So if you want to say like develop a model for augmented reality, you'll, it will probably be used in the living room where you have people. And that means that you can't use self-driving car data because although that data has people, uh, people will only be like a small subset of all the data. And this is mostly outdoors data. So it's a very different domain. Also, stereo techniques don't work, and I'll explain why uh, in the next slide. Uh, so we can't use these traditional computer vision techniques. Uh, so that leaves us to using dev cameras, but they're expensive, and uh, collecting these data sets manually is also expensive. Like, if you're training a model for, say, ImageNet, you can readily go to the web and download plenty of images. Uh, that's really easy to get. but there's not that much depth data available online. So let's talk about first how we see. So how our brain takes uh, images from the two eyes and composes that into a 3D scene. So the way our brain does it is by, since uh, our two eyes are slightly apart from each other, the images that each eye sees will be slightly different. And our brain just measures these differences and it's able to use that to compute that by using a method similar to the formula that I showed you before. Also, our brain pays attention to the visual cues such as the vanishing lines that I showed you before and also motion parallax. But you can think of this as uh, basically as triangulation. So by looking at this image here, you see that if you have two cameras uh, and they take a picture and you know where the two cameras are, like if the scene is standing still, then you can just locate the point, say the elbow on one image, locate it also on the other image. And by doing triangulation, you can find where that point lies in 3D space. And so we, you can compute how far away it is from the camera. Also, you don't need to have two cameras to do this. Like, as long as the scene is static, you can do this with a single camera. And you do that by taking one picture, then moving the camera and taking another picture. And this still works out the same. However, this fails when uh, you have multiple models. Oh, sorry, when you have uh, moving objects, particularly people. And the reason is exemplified in this image right here. So a first time step, you take a picture and the lady like is looking towards you. So you detect the elbow and you'll see that the, you expect the elbow to lie in this line. When you move the camera and take another picture though, since the lady has moved, now the elbow will be in a different position. And when you triangulate the positions now, you'll compute the wrong position in 3D space, meaning that you'll not be able to measure the correct depth. So this basically means that we can't use stereo techniques for uh, 
the scenario with moving people or moving objects. And we might have to use more expensive uh, source of data, such as a depth camera. Or do we have to? Can we get some sorts of data where people are standing still? Fortunately, this is where the internet came to our rescue. Uh, so I'm not sure how many of you have heard about the mannequin challenge, but this was something that was popular online back in 2016 or 2017, if I'm not mistaken. It was on a, one of those challenges like the ice bucket challenge and people would just film themselves doing it and upload the videos to YouTube. And in this challenge, basically what people did is they would stand still pretending to be mannequins and someone else would take a camera and move around the room while filming those people. And so you see here the Portuguese national team standing still while someone is filming them. And basically what this means is that since the people are standing still, then we can use the standard computer vision techniques, the stereo techniques that I mentioned to estimate depth. And so then we can use that depth to train a neural network. And so that's precisely what my team did. So first step, well, actually for step number one should be gathering the data. So just crawling YouTube for mannequin challenge videos and downloading them. Uh, but after you do that, you'll need to compute the positions of the cameras uh, because these are videos from YouTube. So we don't know where the cameras are. So to see how we are able to do that, uh, let's look at this picture. So here we have a 3D object and we have these colored corners. And we also have a bunch of cameras. So if we knew uh, the positions of the cameras, we could say find the ref point in each of the cameras. And since we know where the cameras are, we can triangulate and we can find the 3D coordinates of the point. If on the other hand, we knew where the point was, then we could do basically a rever the reverse of that and use that to figure out the position and the orientation of each of the cameras. However, it seems that we're stuck here, right? Because we don't know either. We don't know the position of any point in the scene, nor do we know the position of the cameras. But fortunately for us, we can actually solve this by making a guess and then iterating on this guess. And uh, for that, we use a technique called structure from motion. And the way it works is as follows. So we take our frames, uh, our different images, and we're going to look for points of interest. Uh, that is like, we're going to look for corners and for like features that are easy to track across images. For example, like the corner of a window or the corner of a door or like the head of a statue, for example. Once we do that, we're going to match those features across all images. So then we'll know, for example, that the head of the statue appears in this, this, and this image. Once we have this, uh, we can just apply the, the iterative method that I explained before. And basically what we're going to be doing is we're going to be optimizing uh, this function or minimizing this function. Uh, this might seem a bit more complicated than it actually is. Uh, basically what we're doing here is we summing, we're summing over all points and summing over all images. And this W is just uh, a weight that's zero if point I does not appear in image J and is one otherwise. The quantity we actually care about is this quantity here. So this is the distance between the observed image location. And this basically means, for example, for like, say this point right here, the observed, observed image location would be say like X, I don't know, uh, let's say 200 pixels and why say yeah, like 100 pixels, 150 pixels, something like that. So that's the observed location of a given point of interest in the image. And this function here will compute the prediction, uh, predicted location. And for that, it takes as input 
the 3D coordinates of the point or our current guess, because initially we don't know anything, so we'll just make a guess. And also the 3D uh, position and orientation of the camera J. And again, in the beginning, this will be a guess. So what we'll do is we'll make a guess, say, about the 3D coordinates, use that to estimate the camera positions, and then take the camera positions and use that to estimate the 3D coordinates. And we'll keep iterating until this converges. So when we're done with this, we're going to have basically for each frame in the video, we're going to know where the camera is and also the position, the 3D positions of the points of interest. Uh, there's just one tiny detail. So if you look at the image here on the left, and if I ask you to guess how tall this train is, you might guess something like two or three meters, uh, but you'd be completely wrong uh, because this is actually a miniature train. Uh, so the correct answer would be just a few centimeters. And the reason I'm showing you this is just to highlight one important point. Uh, structure from motion can really distinguish between uh, a real train and a model train because the information is just not here. Since we have just a single image, it's not possible to say whether this is a real train or a tiny train. And in the videos that we have, although we have multiple images, we don't know how far the camera is moving. So it's impossible to distinguish between a scenario where the camera moves a lot because the scene is big or the camera just moves a tiny bit and you, all you have is a miniature train. So you might think that this actually makes this problem then unsolvable, but you actually see that this doesn't really matter that much. Uh, so we, we can't actually fix this. Uh, and what this will essentially mean is that although we'll be able to estimate uh, depths using structure from motion and the camera positions, they will only be correct up to a scaling factor. And this means that our final depths will only be correct up to a scaling factor. So in practice, this means that if you look at two pixels and uh, you know that one is like three times closer to the camera than the other, you will just know that. So it might be that the one object is like one centimeter away from the camera and the other is three centimeters away or that one is one meter away and the other three meters away. We don't know. We just have this relative notion of depth. So after we have computed the positions of the cameras, uh, we're going to apply uh, stereo. So uh, we actually use something called multi-view stereo. Uh, and the idea is similar to the two-view stereo that I showed before and I'll, that I'll show again now. So you look at the two images, you find matching points, and then you measure the relative displacement between the two images. Then you apply the formula that I showed before, where D is the distance between cameras and F the focal length, and you're good to go, you can compute that. But now remember, because the distance between the cameras is only known up to a scaling factor, that means that the depths will only be known up to the same scaling factor. So you do this and you will get the same image similar to this one. And uh, at this point, then we have camera positions, camera orientations, and depth estimates. So we, we're almost ready to go. The final step, and this is by far the most important step. I only devote one slide to it in the presentation, but if you actually look at the paper, you'll see that the biggest section in the paper is dedicated to data filtering and cleaning. And the reason is that, like in some of the videos, people actually broke the mannequin, so they, they moved at some point or they laughed. And when they do that, the assumptions we make for stereo do no, no longer apply. And that means that the depth will no longer be accurate. Uh, but we also have problems due to motion blur, shadows, like text showing up in the videos. And so we need to filter that. And the way this was done is uh, through multiple steps. One of them uh, was you computed that using a different approach, such as motion parallax. 
and then you filter that that were inconsistent uh, between the multi-view stereo approach and the motion parallax approach. Uh, we also filtered uh, sequences that have a high camera distortion because this is also something that a structure for motion gives us. We filtered short sequences and there was also some manual filtering of the point clouds. After doing all of this, then you finally have a data set that you can use to train. And uh, here I'm showing you uh, some examples from that data set. So on the top, you have the input image and on the bottom, you see the predicted depths or the estimated depths. Uh, you'll notice that you, we only have depths for some points, uh, like the point, the black points are points for which we don't have any depth, but we still have a fairly uh, dense depth for most of the pixels. Uh, and most of the places where we don't have depth, such as this gentleman's uh, shirt, are because uh, since his shirt is flat in the input image, it's really hard for multi-view stereo to match uh, the shirt across the images because like this pixel is quite similar to this one and this one. And so we can get accurate depths for the shirt. But that's also not problematic. So after we uh, got this data, all we need to do now is train a model. But now, because the data doesn't have a notion of scale, uh, we're going to need to adjust our loss. And we actually introduced two other losses as well for other reasons. So one such loss is uh, this smoothness loss or edge aware smoothness loss. And the formula might look a bit scary, uh, but actually the idea behind it is fairly simple. So this Nablu square that you see here is the Laplacian operator. Uh, the Laplacian basically gives you a high value for pixels that are on an edge and a low value that for pixels that are in a flat region. What this means is that when you take the negative exponential of the modulus of the Laplacian of the input image, then if an input pixel is on an edge, then this exponent will be i, meaning that the exponential will be low. And so that term will kind of be ignored. If on the other end, a pixel is in a flat region, then the Laplacian will give a low value and the exponential will give a value closer to one. And so in that case, we'll penalize the Laplacian of uh, the ground the, of the prediction. Basically what this means is that when you're not on an edge, you want the prediction to also not have any edges. That is, you want the prediction to be flat. So this loss encourages the model's predictions to be smooth in the flat image regions, but does not affect the predictions near the edges. Uh, then uh, it was also introduced the second loss called the gradient matching loss. And the idea here is fairly simple. You, you just want to force the gradient of the ground truth and the prediction to match. And the reason for this is that if the gradients match, basically you can get sharper boundaries. Finally, there's the scale invariant uh, mean squared error loss. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, our data now does not have a notion of scale. So we don't know the scale at which our data is. So we don't want to penalize our model for having a different scale than the ground truth, because the ground truth is also in an arbitrary scale and different examples, different videos will have different scales. Basically to adjust the loss, uh, there's this insight that you need to have. So if you have a depth, Y, I, you can decompose that into two factors, the scale and this dimensionless depth. So when you apply the logarithm function, you're gonna get the logarithm of the scaling plus the log of the dimensionless depth. And this log of the scale, because the scale is the same for every image, this will be a constant. So this is what the scale invariant MSC loss actually looks like. So it might look a bit scary, but you'll recognize like two terms. So it's the log of the ground truth and the log of the prediction, and those are the same as in the regular log domain loss. 
But now there's these two extra terms that are computing an average for the predictions and an average for the ground truths. And the reason we are subtracting the averages is the following. When you compute the average, since the log of the scale is a constant, it won't be affected. So when you subtract uh, the average, you will basically cancel out the log of the scale on each of these sides. So meaning that the two of, of the, either the prediction and the ground truth can be at different scales, but the, mod, the loss won't care. So we now model loss functions and data. So we are ready to train a model. And uh, here are some results for using this model. So on the left here, I show you uh, a video that was fed frame by frame to this model. And on the right, I show you the predictions made by multiple models. So one of the models is the DORM model that I mentioned before, and you'll see that it performs fairly poorly. And uh, the main reason for it performing so poorly is that it was trained on data from a different domain. So that's why like, using self-driving car data doesn't really help for the scenario of moving people that we cared about. Uh, this example, Chen et al. Uh, was using a regression network, so you'll see that the predictions are also a bit foggy, but since they also didn't have a data set with people, they also do a lousy job. On the bottom, I show you on the left uh, the predictions made by using stereo, and as you'd expect, uh, these predictions are very flaky. You see that there's a lot of flickering, and that's just because the scene is moving, so stereo doesn't really work and the predictions have a lot of noise. Finally, on the bottom right, you have the prediction made by the mannequin model. So the model trained uh, using the data I just showed you. So this is actually an hourglass network trained with the loss that I showed and the data that I showed. And you'll see that it does a fairly good job, particularly compared with the other models. Although I'd like to note that there's still some flickering that I'll tell you how to deal with uh, in a few slides. So here are just a few more uh, examples of predictions. So on the top, you have the input image, then you have the ground truth. Uh, then you have the predictions made by our model. And on the last row is something I didn't call it, talk about. Uh, but if you look at the paper, you'll see that they have uh, this non-monocular model. Uh, so I called it your plus parallax. So basically the difference between the last two rows is that for the last row, the model was trained uh, with the input image, but also with the prior depth estimate. So say that you have some other way of uh, estimating depth, but that way of estimating depth does not work for people then what you do is you mask out people and feed the, this depth that you are sure about and the input image to the model. And the model would be basically able to in-paint uh, the depth for the people. And uh, this actually works a bit better than just uh, the monocular model. As you can see by looking at this image right here, if you look at the arm of the little girl, you see that when we use a prior depth, the arm is at the same depth as the body, while in the monocular model, uh, the arm is closer to the camera than the rest of the body. Um, so let me show you now some applications of using this model. So uh, the one on the left, I already showed you in the beginning of the presentation. I just didn't tell you that uh, it was obtained using uh, the mannequin model. So here on the bottom, you have an input video, and on the right, you have estimated depth using this model. And by having this, you can apply this synthetic defocusing as a post-processing step. So you can at any time decide whether you want to focus on, the, on this guy or on the background, or even on these people if you want to. Uh, another application would be object insertion. And so here you have the same scene, uh, but now uh, uh, basically this floor was introduced. Uh, so I can, you can think of this as 
uh, augmented reality or something that you do, for example, in a movie. And you see that there's some flickering, so it's not perfect, but the model seems to do a fairly good job. Oops. Uh, another application would be for something I also showed in the beginning, the Ken Burns effect, and here it was applied to the video that I already showed. So at any moment, you can decide to stop the video. And since we can compute the depth, then we can also compute novel views from slightly different locations. And you can generate effects like this. So let me think, okay, I think I'm almost out of time, but let me just uh, tell you a bit more about something called the consistency loss. So I showed you before that, even though the predictions were fairly good, there was still a bit of flickering in the outputs from the model. And the reason for that is that the model has a lot of freedom, particularly because it's not predicting depth at a fixed scale. So it, there's nothing forcing it to make consistent predictions. However, we can do that by adding an extra loss. So we can take two different frames from the video, feed them to the network and compute the depth maps. And then you look at a particular point in the two images. And since we know where the cameras are, we can basically compute the 3D coordinates because we know where the, where the camera is, how far away it is from the camera. So we can do that for each of the cameras. And what will happen is that, oops, uh, the two predictions will not match and there will be a gap between the two. So what we'll do is we'll add an extra loss that minimizes this gap. And by doing this, we force the model to make more consistent predictions as I'll show you in this video. So here on the left, you see the input video, then you have uh, the predictions from a stereo model. Uh, and as you'll see, because the guy is moving, the predictions will be fairly bad. Then you have the predictions from the mannequin model. And finally, after adding the consistency loss. So looking at the stereo first, you see that because the guy is moving, there's lots of like black spots. That just means that uh, the prediction is failing and that's due to the stereo constraints not being met. Now looking at the mannequin model, you'll see that it does a fairly good job, but as before, it's not super consistent and there's like flickering, particularly in his torso. However, after adding the consistency loss, the results improve quite a lot. As you see here on the last part, and you see that the predictions are fairly stable. So I think this is pretty much all I have to say. Uh, let me just give you some main takeaways. So first of all, I hope that after this, you think that that estimation is useful and fun. Uh, but most importantly, uh, I think one of the things I'd like you to take away from this talk is that by being creative about data, you can solve your problems. Um, so the key insight of uh, this paper was not any new model or any new loss function. It was just coming up with a new source for data, YouTube videos of people doing mannequin challenge and using that to train a model. Secondly, uh, data cleaning is super important and at least as important as modeling, if not a lot more, and I'd probably say that it's more. I mean, it's always good to have good models, but if uh, your data is not good, better models will probably not help you. And finally, domain knowledge is also super important uh, because if you have domain knowledge about the problem, you can introduce these tailored losses that uh, bias the model towards better results. Um, as you've seen in the consistency loss that I just showed, or the edge aware smoothness loss that I showed before. So this is all from my end. Uh, feel free now to ask any questions. I guess I don't have anything else to say. Yeah, thank you for watching. Thank you, Telmo, for the amazing presentation. Um, thank you for yeah, my pleasure. Uh, the audience.
to. Uh, I think we can start questions. I will see if you have some. Uh, okay. Does your model perform better than a uh, RGBP camera, Expo Skinet? Uh, probably not. Um, and so I think with this model is that the predictions that you get don't have a scale. So for any of the applications they showed, like for example, uh, this one here, since you don't have scale, uh, you kind of need to learn a scale. So there are other ways to find the scale. Like sometimes you have other information and with a dev camera, you get scale right away. Like if you look at the output from the dev camera, you'll know that, yeah, like this pixel is say three meters away from the camera. Well, with this model, you don't. Um, but the advantage of this model is that one, it works just with a single image. So you can possibly run this on a phone like now. So nowadays phones have multiple cameras, uh, but like in the past, it did not. Uh, for example, if you look at the Google Pixel phones until the Pixel 4, I think, I think the Pixel 4 already had two cameras, but before that it did not. And uh, so it had to use some techniques like this to be able to work and to compute that. So of course, like, Having a depth camera is probably better, but some cases you just can't have it. Um, we have a follow-up question that João uh, Janeiro also made one. I don't know if, João, do you want to make the question yourself? We can give you, um, we can unlock your, mic your microphone. Wait, can you unlock João Janeiro microphone, please? So can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Perfectly. Okay. Yes. So the question is, is using this uh, single camera method faster than using stereo cameras? That's a good question. Uh, so it depends. So probably if we use the full model as um, it was trained, the full network, probably not. Uh, but the advantage of a model like this is that you can distill it into a smaller model and with a smaller model, it will run a lot, a lot faster than stereo. And also with stereo, like, unless the cameras are synchronized, uh, you will not be able to measure the depths of people. Did this answer your question, Drew? Well, if you mute yourself, you... No, oh, thank you. I, I couldn't unmute myself. Uh, yes, yes, this is very helpful. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a small uh, notice for everyone. If you mute yourself after giving permission, you will not be able to unmute yourself. Right? The, the unmute is a special permission that only we can give. Uh, the follow-up question was, is there any reason to not use dedicated hardware for this? Uh, I think you kind of also. It's said. it's expensive. That's the main reason. Um, example, like pixel phones the didn't have dedicated that hardware, and uh, like in some cases, like if you want to have say like a single camera in the IoT device, you'll probably the depth camera will be too expensive. But the technique like these is relatively cheaper to run. Okay. Uh, just a small point again, if you want to make a question yourself, please raise the hand and we'll unlock your microphone. In the meantime, my father will do the next one. This next question is, given the convolution used in your network, is there any size limit for the objects? So that's why um, the models that I showed, they either use dilated convolutions. And in that case, basically, even though the kernel will be small, it, it can compute features at different scales because you can imagine it as sort of spreading out. 
Uh, but in the other architectures of the hourglass network, the image was downsampled. So the image was made smaller. And uh, in that case, if the image is smaller, that means that uh, this five by five filter can capture uh, more of the image. So it doesn't really matter. Like if you have, say like, uh, for example, right now, if you look at my photo, like my ad is covering most of the frame, but if I downsample this image, it will, my face will only cover a few pixels. So a small kernel will be able to capture that as well. I hope that, that yes. cleared that up. Oh. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, please, uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, talking, you can raise your hands in, the, in this platform or you can write your question. The next question is, I think, Mari. Yeah, that's right. Since there are no volunteers, We'll read them from the chat. Can you use the post processing method to scale the depth map of your model dealing with it? Uh, toy sorry, can you say that again? There was some uh, problem with the connection I missed. Sorry. Can you use a post processing method to scale the depth map of your model, the output of the model? Uh, yes. So say that you want to, for example, you apply this model to some data you have from some other source. Uh, and uh, if you have some way of estimating that from that other source, say, for example, you have limited supervision because uh, like you had LIDAR for some points, for example, then you can use that to scale the predictions from this network. Um, another thing that you can do is, I mean, like if you're looking at a video that it's like a user is filming with the camera in the living room and like you see, I don't know, like a cat, you can probably guess how big the cat is. It's probably not a miniature cat. So that's something that's not in the image. That is, this is like prior information that you can introduce saying like, yeah, a cat is normally, I don't know, 50 centimeters tall, something like that. This is, this is my own a question, but could you train your model to output something like from zero to one, a normalized value of depth map, and then giving some scale, uh, scale up to whatever was the correct depth map? Yeah, so. so you work with a toy train or a real toy or whatever, he only learns relative depth scale, and then there is a function that grabs it relative and converts them to absolute, even two, two, two objects in the, the, the image that they use as reference and they know that this has to scale like this. Is that possible? Will this uh, allow to have tracer learning with your model and then use it in other scenarios, in other images? In mm -hmm. other yeah, that's a great question. So uh, right now, the, the model that I showed you, it doesn't predict steps from zero to one, but that's really easy to scale. Uh, like. The predictions that the model makes are only relative depths. So although they're not limited to zero to one, uh, you can manually you can do that as a post-processing step. So you just find like the maximum depth that your network can predict and you normalize accordingly. Uh, you mentioned about uh, then taking this to make other predictions, and that's precisely what uh, was done for some of the examples they showed. Uh, so the all you need to do is if you have some other way of computing that, then you can just scale the model prediction. And it doesn't really matter if it's from zero to one or if the, what the model gives you is from uh, zero to 10,000. That's uh, irrelevant. You just multiply by the correct scaling factor and you can get a metric predictions. Okay, so uh, I didn't forget that the model worked in uh, relatively depth instead of absolute. yeah so but yeah that might add then that's uh so that, that's why we had to use the um, the oh, 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 what did i call it uh scale invariant loss and uh because we have no way of distinguishing that was the example of the train we have no way of distinguishing a big train from a small train 
So we just don't really care about whatever scale our model outputs. Uh, it's scale invariant. You can you the output you can think of it as just telling you like this object is closer than that object and that and how much closer it is. But you you can't use that as a metric unit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The next question is, the model does not only predict the depth of the pixel, but also perform edge de detection. Did you, did you test edge de detection with your model? Could uh, an, an edge detection model be added to your model to increase performance or reduce complexity? Uh, so that would probably be something you do before deep learning. Uh, like you try to come up with features that are useful and to your model and add them and train the model with them and see if they help. Uh, the idea of using deep learning is to let the model learn those useful features. So we don't really know how the network is doing what it's doing. Uh, we don't really force it to learn to find edges or learn to find anything. We just compose the architecture in a way that it can capture features at different scales because it sees the image and smaller copies of it, but we didn't do anything for edges or any other thing. Uh, you might be asking that because I mentioned the edge aware, aware, aware loss. Uh, that was just to make the results look better. It's, you can think of that as a regularization. So if you have a scene, and let me show you an image. Uh, yeah, you're from the video. Uh, if you look at the input video here, uh, for example, the, the shirt of the guy, it, it has some edges, but it's mostly flat. So we kind of bias the model to make the same prediction for flat regions, because odds are if you have something in the image that looks flat, probably that's an object that's all at the same distance from the camera. And so the edge aware smoothness loss was added basically to make, to force the model or to regularize the model to make flat predictions in those regions that we think are the same object. And uh, the only, we use the edges just to not penalize the model and not force the model to make flat predictions for say like between the arm and the floor, because like the arm and the floor are very different. There's like a sharp contrast between the two, so there will be a strong edge here. And we don't want to model to make like foggy or blurry predictions. We want it to be able to make a really sharp boundary between the floor and the arm of uh, this man. I hope this uh, cleared it up. Yes, for me, yes. <laughs> I don't know if anybody have doubts but if you have any doubts you can raise your hand or write your answer uh Jean -Marie, i can Kui, can you give again a permission yes. to run the lab, please you can talk not yet can you please give John the man permission to talk? Oh, oh, thank you. I think, yes. Okay, so the question is, uh, how do narrow models in this topic, so deep learning models, how do those compare to simple models? So using things like surf and maybe gradients and those type of simple methods, how do they compare nowadays? Is it much better? Uh, yes. More? Yes, um, like just to do that estimation properly, you need to have a good understanding of the image. And uh, for that, neural networks do work much better than classical techniques. Although traditional techniques were used uh, to generate the data, for example. So if you go back to the part I was talking about, how to do structure from motion, like this part here, this was all using SIFT and exactly. doing feature matching. This was used to generate the data that we then train the neural network on. But for the neural network itself, it works much better to use a neural network rather than a simpler model. 
And what are the speed differences between these two? So uh, using these big models versus uh, simple methods. So guessing you'd use this on something like a phone, uh, how much impact does yeah. it have? So, I mean, you, you couldn't really do what we did here with like simpler methods. I mean, you could possibly make a, a simpler model uh, that, you know, looks for edges, like someone was suggesting before. Uh, and that probably will be faster, but the results will be really bad in terms of speed. So the model itself that we train is a fairly big model and uh, that would not run fast. However, the advantage of neural networks is that it's relatively easy to distill the network into a smaller model. And if you do that, then it runs much faster. Uh, like if you look at the cameras from modern smartphones, they all use neural networks inside and they can take pictures pretty much real time and do all their processing in real time. Uh, so the models are just not as big as the one that I showed you, but there will be distilled versions of models similar to this one. Thank you. Really cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there anyone that wants to make uh, another question? Tell. If not, uh, we can end the session. Um, uh, wait, can you give me access to, to share my PowerPoint? If you like to be a speaker or you have something to, to share with us, please fill our coffee proposals. Uh, this is our social media. Please contact contact us. We, we have social media with Meetup, Facebook, link, uh, LinkedIn and Twitter also. Uh, don't drop the call. We have a, a network session. We will, we will end the session, but we, we can talk not for me if you want. Or, and you can ask some questions to, to Delmo if you want. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Delmo, for this wonderful well, session. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> and thank you for the young audience. <laughs> You can hear the session, please.